As many of you are veterans of House of Delegates meeting, you know that when the president's um, remarks at the end of their term are given, it's often a time when he or she reports on the activities that have happened during the bar year. Uh, I did this to some extent at the convention, um, talking about the Lawyer Image Task Force, uh, the Member Involvement Task Force, and our work with the solo and small section, um, which were reported then. And I had planned on talking about two additional initiatives of the bar today. Um, those initiatives are um, first a technology initiative. Um, this year we've worked actively in the area of technology to match up the business of the bar with current technology in order to do our business as effectively and efficiently as we can. That's been done in many ways, but perhaps none more prominent than our work with the court on the AIS system which when completed will provide benefits such as a one-stop shop for all rosters that you might be on in the state, as well as e-filings. Uh, the other issue I want, ha had planned to spend more time with today was 608, long a thorn in the side of the South Carolina bar. Uh, we, uh, in a case called Ex Parte Brown, um, the bar filed an amicus brief, and last June, in the Brown decision, the court agreed with the positions the bar took in our amicus brief, which essentially challenged the constitutionality of unfunded court appointments. Uh, and since that time, we have worked closely with the General Assembly. Um, and I'm pleased to report that while we are not yet done, we feel we are on our way and we have our fingers crossed that the notion of unfunded court appointments uh, may soon be a thing of the past. And the credit for that goes to a lot of people, most of whom were involved way before I took this office and our staff and our attorneys, John Nichols and Blake Hewitt, you know, many past presidents who've been very active in this, but I wanted to report to you the good progress in that area and keep our fingers crossed. We, we feel like we're close to getting that done, largely in due to the Brown decision. So that, th those were the things I had planned to spend some time with and go into in detail. Um, but I have decided to talk about a different topic because you have a report in front of you that outlines the activities of the bar in a little more detail. Um, it, as all of you no doubt know, uh, a, a month or so ago, our U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments about the constitutionality of the Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare. And I suspect there's no more controversial political topic than health care. If we surveyed the group in here, it probably would be split at least like our state and perhaps somewhat like our nation with many people having a certain view and many people having a different view. And I'm certainly not weighing in on the merits of that today. That would be improper for a mandatory bar and not the point of, that I want to make. But I do think those arguments and the upcoming decision create an issue that's important to our profession, and that's the independence of the judiciary. We've seen in South Carolina efforts to attack the, the independence of our judiciary. We've seen outside um, uh, the state interest groups attempt to be involved in judicial elections. And when that's happened, this bar has stood up and said, that's not right. Our judiciary is independent. It's not the pawn of any political party or any political action committee or any special interest group. And I think we were right to do that. And I also think that if the reports or predictions of a decision this month come to pass, that we may soon have another situation to think about and talk about the independence of the judiciary. I have no idea what the outcome of that decision will be, um, but I suspect it's safe to say that a large portion of our population will be excited about it and a very close percentage will be very disappointed in it. And when that happens, how will we respond? Well, almost 12 years ago, our country faced a similar situation. We were on the heels of 
rather at the beginning of a bitter presidential election. As we all remember, it came down to Florida. It was so close that recounts were ordered. And those recounts led to litigation that ultimately made their way to our Supreme Court. And as we all remember, the court um, in Bush versus Gore rendered a decision that ordered that the recounts be stopped. And that, George, and that called for George, uh, the Florida delegates to be certified to George Bush, and George Bush became our 43rd president. At that time, it was a very close election. Our country was somewhat divided. There were many people supportive of that. Republicans were ecstatic. Democrats were not. What did Vice President Gore do? In what many people think was his finest hour, he didn't criticize the legitimacy of that opinion. He accepted it as legitimate, stepped aside, allowing President Bush to become our president. At the time, that didn't make a big impression on me. I kind of took it for granted in all honesty. But since that time, we've seen some international events that make me more appreciative of that respect for the law. We've seen what happens in Tunisia, and we've seen what happens in Egypt, in Libya, in Syria, and other countries that have power transitions that don't respect the rule of law. And it's made me more appreciative of that principle that we have in our country. The, as I said, I have um, no idea what's going to happen with that decision. I laugh when the people on TV can predict what they think is going to happen by questions that are asked. I wish I could take some of those people to court with me. For 25 years, I've been blown away and surprised by judges and juries um, with the decisions made after I think a, a case has gone a certain way. But while I don't know what that decision will be, I think our profession can serve as an example for how to respond to that decision. We, like the rest of society, have every right, if we disagree with the decision, to talk about it, to discuss it, to even argue about it. That's what democracy is all about. But as we do, I hope we'll be careful about how we do it and do it in a way that under, doesn't undermine the rule of law that we have in our country and the independence of the judiciary. So whenever that decision comes, I would ask that we all take a deep breath when it comes out and that we refrain from personal attacks on the justices that we might disagree with, that we refrain from calling them Reagan appointees or Clinton appointees, or Bush appointees, or Obama appointees, and that even if we disagree with the decision, that we respect it as being made by justices doing their best to apply the law in a difficult situation that's been put in their laps. Because that really is what's happening, not just in high profile cases, but the cases we all deal with on a much smaller scale here in South Carolina, and they're dealt with across the country. And all those decisions need the respect of the rule of law, and all that, and that respect of the rule of law, I believe, depends on the independence of the judiciary. So I'm sorry to be somewhat preachy on that on my last time before you. You know the story of the old preacher who, who after hitting home with a topic, a member of the congregation says, now preacher, you've stopped preaching and started meddling. Um, I didn't mean to preach, and I certainly didn't mean to meddle, but I, but, but I hope we can um, think about that in the coming weeks or months when that decision comes out. Um, in closing, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it's been to serve as your bar president this year. It has been the most fun year I have ever had since finishing law school. And I'd like to thank just a few groups of people um, right now. Um, first of all, members of the South Carolina Bar staff, would you please stand? Got a lot of them here. I don't know if we have any. There's some manning technology. Um, I think everyone in this room knows what a great staff we have. Um, our executive director, Bob Wells, and everyone that's standing up, and many that are not, do such a good job and deserve tons of credit because they keep me out of trouble constantly. And please join me in thanking them. <laughs> Members of the Board of Governors, would you please stand? 
You all know these members of the Board of Governors, but I want to make sure that some of you don't see their faces. Um, I have delegated a lot of responsibilities um, this year. I mean, we've had task forces that have been set up, committees that have been set up, and all these people have been active in running those. And along with the staff, these are the folks who've carried out the, the, the business and done the good work um, that has been done this year. And please join me in thanking this group. Now, the screw-ups that have taken place, they all are my fault. But the good news is you're in better hands in the future. Um, Angus is poised to have a great year next year as your bar president. And after that, Alice and Cal and Ann are in position um, so that there's plenty of talent and plenty of time to fix all the things I've messed up. Um, the third group of people um, I want to thank is our Supreme Court. Um, our, our court um, members um, are not here yet. They'll be here. I think Justice Baconis is coming today to do the swearing in. Um, we've worked closely with our court this year, um, certainly with the AIS system, but in many other ways. And having that support and working relationship with the court not only makes the job more enjoyable, but it certainly, I think, makes us more effective. And I want to thank the court, and, and I would encourage any of you who see um, members later on to do that. That's been helpful to us. And the last group of people I want to thank is you, the members of the House. Um, Y'all are the policy members. Um, you set the policy for our bar. Um, I'm particularly excited that we had more contested elections for House seats this year than we've had in a long time. So maybe that's a member involvement issue for which Cal can take credit, but it certainly is pleasing to me that there's folks in the state who want to serve in this important role. Um, many of you have given me encouragement through the year, and it's been very helpful to me, and I'd encourage you to do that to, um, the, to Angus and the other presidents who come along. So thank you again for letting me serve as your president. It's been fun, and I look forward to stepping and taking the best job in America, which is past president. <laughs>